2 Corinthians 5, verses 14 through 21. For Christ's love compels us, because we are convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died. And he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if, any was, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone. The new is here. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God was making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who has no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Last week at this time, we were on the cusp of a new year and uh, talking about the fact that, that it seemed as if it was just very recently that we were talking about 2019 being a new year and what our plans were going to be, what we hope to accomplish, what we hope to fulfill as far as serving the Lord here at the Broken Arrow Church. And we noted that time just goes by so very, very fast. Hard to believe, as we mentioned last week, that it's been 20 years since Y2K when we were scrambling for generators and bottled water and beef jerky and MREs and survivalist supplies. Uh, people who were in those businesses did very, very well in, in 1999. Finally, after services last Sunday when I was talking with Cindy Tate and Megan Teener, Pat Smith's name to me. Remember I blanked out last Sunday morning on Pat's first name? It was Pat Smith in McDermott Road that first Sunday, January the 2nd, uh, 2000, who invited everyone over to his house and Virginia's house for a bottled water and beef jerky party that night so that we could start cycling through some of those supplies that we had. Uh, now it's, it's the first Sunday of a new year, the first Sunday of a new decade, maybe, depending on who you talk to and uh, how you calculate that. For those of you who insist on using the Farmer's Almanac calculation and the U.S. Naval Observatory standards, which maintains that new decades start in years ending with a one and not years ending with a zero, that's fine, that's okay. Just please excuse the rest of us while we get on with our new one and uh, we'll welcome you aboard this time next year. Don't tell Vince Carter that it's not a new decade. Uh, playing for the Miami Heat last night, excuse me, the Atlanta Hawks against the, the Pacers, he became the first player in NBA history to play in four decades. Uh, his first season was 1998-1999. There was a lockout that fall, so his first game didn't come till January or February of 99. But just for comparison, uh, Tom Brady was just in his first year as a starting quarterback at the University of Michigan uh, when Vince Carter played in, in his first game. So it's incredible that he is now in his fourth decade. There's just a, a very powerful and positive vibe that's associated with the word new. And that's not without some exceptions, but generally it's the case that the word new generates positive feelings and a lot of excitement. You can hear the excitement in people's voices when they say, I got a new car, or we bought a new house, or we built a new house, or I have a new job, or I got a new phone. Uh, my old one was like eight months old, so I went and got a new phone. People turn over a new leaf, they get a new lease on life, they enjoy newfound freedom, they have a new outlook. 
historically speaking, when people established new settlements and territories, they would often name that place new someplace or another in hopes and anticipation of reestablishing and recreating what they considered to be the best and the most positive things that they associated with their previous experience. So in 1624, when the Dutch settled Manhattan Island as a part of what they were going to call New Netherland, they named that settlement New Amsterdam. Uh, they liked the old Amsterdam and they wanted to, to build a new one. 42 years later in 1664, the English took over the place, so they called it New York, uh, hearkening back to their English homeland and their English heritage. And that's how we got place names like New Jersey and New Mexico and New Orleans, uh, New South Wales in Australia, where sadly uh, wildfires are raging and uh, causing so much destruction, as well as in other parts of the country. Uh, New South Wales was named after Old North Wales, uh, from which many of the people had come. It's doubtful that there will ever be a settlement established known as New Chernobyl. Um, we just want to establish new places that have positive connotations from the past. New is intended to evoke the positive. Uh, sometimes in life we want a new start. Before I, I decided to train for ministry, my plan was to head to Auburn University in the fall of 1981 to begin a five-year program in forest engineering. And my plans changed late that summer, almost before school started, but my intention had been that when I got on campus, I was just going to start over. Uh, I knew practically no one there among the 25 or 30,000 students on campus, and I thought I could just begin again, even with a new name. For 18 years, I had been called Tim, and I thought that was long enough. I thought it was time for a new name, and I would go by my middle name, which is Dwight. Uh, I still occasionally use that in fast food drive through uh, instances where they ask for a name or on seating lists at restaurants. Occasionally, I'll stop in to see Jeff at his Keller Williams office. I rarely find him there because he's out selling houses, which is great. Uh, but I always leave uh, a, a message with the receptionist to leave Jeff a note that Dwight stopped by and sorry that I missed him. And he always knows who's, who, who that is. I ended up going that fall to Alabama Christian in Montgomery uh, before transferring to Lipscomb the next year. I already knew people on campus there, so I couldn't pull it off. So I just, I had just had to stay Tim for the rest of my life. But what God offers us through his son, Jesus Christ, is far more than a new name or a new image or a new chapter, or a new leaf. He gives us new life. Uh, he gives us truly a new identity and a new hope. Jesus came as a new voice. Jesus' voice was not the voice of the law and the prophets. It wasn't even a voice that was meant to abolish the law and the prophets. It was a voice that was intended to fulfill the law and the prophets. In Luke 16, 16, Jesus said, the law and the prophets were proclaimed until John, John the baptizer, John the forerunner, his relative in the flesh. The law and the prophets were proclaimed until then. Since that time, the good news of the kingdom of God has been preached. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 2, uh, the writer says, even though God spoke in all this various ways and various manners and past times through prophets uh, and, and so many different ways as well, he would use angels, he would use visions, he would use dreams. All that aside, the writer says, in these last days, God's new voice is that of his son. In these last days, God has spoken to us by his son. So everything about Jesus is new. And the new teaching of Jesus wouldn't be able to be contained in the old wineskins of the law of Moses. It was going to require the new wineskins of a new covenant, a covenant of grace and truth, a covenant that Jeremiah had prophesied about in being a covenant in which God would forgive our iniquities and remember our sins no more. There was going to be a new and better sacrifice. There was going to be a new and better priesthood, new and better promises, a new and better hope. 
We've just come through the, the Christmas season. I know we enjoyed singing many of those songs of, of faith centered around the coming of the Son of God into this world. One that we sang here two or three times recently in regard to the announcement of the angels to the shepherds near Bethlehem was Hark, the herald angels sing. And in verse 3 of that song, it, say, it says, Hail the heaven-born Prince of Peace, hail the Son of Righteousness. Light and life to all he brings, risen with healing in his wings. Mild, he lays his glory by, and that's what Rob was reading about from Philippians chapter 2, his divesting of himself of, of that glory, willingly laying that aside. Mild, he lays his glory by, born that man no more may die. Born to raise the sons of earth, born to give them second birth, born to give them new life. And that's what Jesus talks to Nicodemus about, that you can't see the kingdom of God unless you've been born again, unless you're born of the water and the spirit. And he says to him very pointedly, you must be born again. Romans 6, 3 and 4, don't you know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Therefore, we've been buried with him through baptism into death so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too, we also might walk in newness of life. We might be raised to walk in new life. Not like new, but new. There's a difference between new and like new. I was in the mood and spirit this year uh, to give books as gifts, Christmas gifts to friends and, and family members. And uh, among Kim's gifts was a photographic book uh, focused on Mississippi, her home state. And I, I found the one that I wanted, but I couldn't find a new one. I, I checked Amazon, there were no new ones, there were only used ones, but I really liked the book and thought she would like it. So I started scrolling through their used inventory and there was one that I found that had actually been signed by the author and photographer, Ken Murphy. But I was concerned about the condition. So you know how on used items they have the condition description. And the condition said, like new, superficial marring on the front cover. And that superficial marring was that little spot right there, which, Maybe it shouldn't bother me that much, but it bothers me that, that much. That's not uh, like a green mark. It, it's, it's a divot down into to the cover. It's a really nice cover, really thick cover. It's green down under the surface for some reason. And, you know, it just bothered me that that is there. She still loved the book. Everything inside is fine, but it wasn't new. It was like new but I prefer new to like new. Jesus doesn't make us like new. He makes us like new, completely new. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the passage that David read for us. Another translation, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation, a new creature. The old has gone, the new has come. Jake Purdy enjoyed that new life last Sunday. Uh, we were blessed to hear his beautiful confession of, of faith in Jesus Christ. That's why I wanted him to share with you what he had shared with me earlier that morning when I said, you know, I, I understand what you believe about Jesus. Why do you want to be baptized this morning? And he told you what he had told me earlier, uh, that he wanted Jesus to wash his sins away. He wanted to live with, with Jesus forever. And we had the joy of, of sharing in the moment of his immersion into Christ. It was sort of a dual immersion into Christ and ice bucket challenge because as I mentioned, the water was cold. And uh, thank you, Brandon Tiener and Robert Wilson for discovering the clogged filters that contributed things. It's nice and warm today, by the way. Nice and warm and inviting today. Uh, but it was so exciting uh, to hear his confession, to share in his immersion into Christ, and to celebrate his new life in Jesus. And we were also blessed last Sunday and inspired last Sunday by the humble, beautiful example of our brother, Sean Cole, who came before us to say that, that he had been struggling, 
that he had wandered spiritually and he wanted to walk more closely with, with Jesus again. And his confessional heart and his confessional spirit laid claim to the continual cleansing, the continual newness that we have access to in the blood of Christ. Uh, 1 John chapter 1, verses 7 and 8. If we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus' his Son purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins as Sean so humbly confessed his sins, Christ is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and will purify us from all righteousness. That text slides right into the beginning of chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anyone does sin, and you will, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for our sins, but also for those of the whole world. Sean was as new in Christ last Sunday as the day he was baptized into Christ on June the 6th last year. Ever new in Jesus Christ. It's like deja vu all over again. It's like baptism all over again, except we don't have to be baptized again because the cleansing is just as real and just as full and just as complete. And so it was wonderful to see that newness enjoyed both by Jake and by Sean last Sunday. Sean just reaffirmed his confession, I'm with Jesus, I'm with him, I lay claim to the power of his blood. Who you're with sometimes makes all the difference in the world. Last, uh, well, I guess it was four years ago last fall, the fall of, of 2015, um, I met a man, a very wonderful, kind, and compassionate man named Mark Mills Powell. Those are a couple of pictures of Mark at the top. These were off social media, which I was still on at the time that I, that I met Mark. And uh, I met him on my annual silent sabbatical retreat at the Abbey of Gethsemane in Kentucky. And would later learn late that week that, uh, of course, observing silence there. We didn't figure this out till late in the week, but turns out that he is a priest in the Church of England. He had spent a lot of time in the U.S., had worked with some Anglican churches in the U.S., was, but was back in Cambridge, England at the time. We had seen one another for two or three days, passed one another, smiled at one another, saw one another in the dining room, but obviously no conversation as per the observance of silence there at the retreat house in the grounds of the monastery, but near the end of the week, we ran into one another at the visitor's center, which, uh, in which conversation is permitted. And so having seen one another for several days, just decided to introduce ourselves. And I learned that his wife, Dana, had passed away just a few months earlier after a courageous battle with lung cancer. Uh, they had three young adult daughters, Phoebe and Bridget and Rachel. Uh, that's Phoebe with her mom at the bottom. She raised a, a lot of money for uh, cancer research during the time that her mother was undergoing treatment and uh, continues to do that. But he and, he and his daughters were taking the loss very, very hard. And uh, we stayed in touch. We corresponded by, by email. But that day in the visitor center, Mark asked me, would you like to go on a walk uh, tomorrow afternoon back to Thomas Merton's Hermitage? Uh, Thomas Merton was one of the monks there at the Abbey of Gethsemane for a long time. He died in 1968. He was a well-known author and, and theologian. But he lived in a solitary hermitage there among the 2,000 acres uh, that were held by the monastery. But it was on the side of the road that had signs posted on it, monastic area, do not enter. I had never been over on, on that side of the road. And so when he asked me if I wanted to go on a walk, back to Merton's hermitage, I said, would love to, but I don't think we're supposed to. And he said, well, I have a long-standing relationship with the monastic community here, and, and it'll be okay. I was still nervous about it. Uh, like to abide by the regulations and, and rules, didn't want to get into trouble, but I met him at the appointed time, and we could start out on this walk in a place I'd never been before. And so about 45 minutes 
into the walk, uh, we're approached by uh, two Trappist monks coming from the other direction on a four-wheeler. And thinking about it afterwards, it sort of sounds like the beginning of a bad joke. So an Anglican priest and a Church of Christ preacher were walking back to Merton's Hermitage when two monks on a four-wheeler come, come riding up. Except there's no punchline to the story. I just got really nervous uh, because I was somewhere I wasn't supposed to be. And they slowed down, they smiled, they waved, and they kept on riding. Uh, not because they recognized me, uh, but because they recognized him. And that was going to be my only plea, uh, was I'm with him. Uh, he said it was okay. And in regard to our salvation, in regard to our new life, and Jesus Christ, that is our only reply that we can make. That is our only plea, our only defense, our only hope is to say that I'm with Jesus. I trust him, my faith is in him, I obey him, I submit to him, I follow him, I was united with him. His blood cleanses me from all sin. He gives me new life. He grants us salvation and continual cleansing. He gives us 24-7 access to the throne of God's grace. Another passage that uh, Rob shared with us from Hebrews chapter 4. Because we have such a sympathetic, merciful high priest in Jesus Christ, we can always, ever come boldly and confidently before the, the throne of God's grace to find mercy, to find grace to help in time of, of need. He ever lives to make intercession for us. In answer to the questions, when should I allow Jesus to do that? When should I allow Jesus to make me new? When should I trust him to wash away my sins? When should I be united with him in baptism? When should I return to faithfully walking with him? The answer is always now. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 1 and 2 if you guys could pull that up for me, for some reason the, the remote is hanging up. As God's co-workers, and if we had read this right after what David read, we would recognize these are the verses immediately following that, that reading about our newness in Jesus Christ and the word of reconciliation and the ministry of reconciliation that's been given to us. As God's co-workers, we urge you not to receive God's grace in vain, for he says... Quoting from Isaiah 49, 8, In the time of my favor I heard you, and in the day of salvation I helped you. I tell you, now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. Today is always the day of salvation. Jake made last Sunday his day of salvation. Sean renewed that relationship last Sunday, as new as the day he was baptized last June and I would encourage you if you haven't yet expressed your faith as Jake did last Sunday if if you like Sean feel that that you've been distant from the Christ who saved you and want a closer walk with him the time to do that is not sometime the time to do that is now the time to do that is today and we remind you of that opportunity not only to make those needs known but any need that you have, we ask that you come and make that known while we're standing and singing this song together.